the latest on Giannis Antetokounmpo, his calf injury, and what it means for the first round of Pacers Bucks. Plus, plenty more notes about the Pacers, the playoffs, and their season, including the play-in tournament, who the Pacers want to win, Halliburton's on case draft picks being finalized, and plenty more coming on today's Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, y'all? Happy Tuesday and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers as always. My name is Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI. And today it is extremely late, almost 3 a.m. Just covered the draft. Congrats to the Fever and the people I know there on landing Caitlin Clark. But we have a lot to talk about with the Pacers, who had the day off of WNBA Draft Day to watch that and create a video of them celebrating Caitlin Clark coming to Indy as they focus ahead on the Bucks. They're going to practice Tuesday. We're going to hear from them because this is a big series. And the big news that came out Monday about the series was from Shams Trania about the latest on Giannis Antetokounmpo's calf injury, what that will mean for the series. We'll dissect that, Giannis's impact, all sorts of stuff there. And then a couple notes to kind of wrap up the Pacers season in my head and give you all the information you need to know to set the scene going forward, including Halliburton's chances at All-NBA, draft picks, some bonuses, the play-in tournament, who the Pacers should, in my eyes, want to win, and lots more coming here today as we get through ahead of Pacers Bucks. Tomorrow, we'll have a Pacers-related guest on to talk Pacers Bucks from a Pacers perspective. And then Friday, we'll probably have uh, the Locked On Bucks co-hosts on to do a crossover previewing the series and we'll just keep talking Pacers Bucks all week with various other guests in Pacerland. We start today looking at the series through the lens of the biggest non-Pacers thing entering the series, which is Giannis Antetokounmpo's health. Unfortunately, health will be a big storyline and this is out of the Pacers control and of course it'd be awesome if they could beat any team at maximum health. Uh, but Shams Trani are reporting uh, Monday morning that Giannis Antetokounmpo real doubt about his status to start the series. Trania's tweet in full says, Bucks Giannis Antetokounmpo is rehabbing daily, but there's some real doubt for his status to begin series versus Pacers on Sunday. Although Giannis has rare recovery ability, he's very much up in the air for game one. I, if you remember, Zach Pearson and I talked about his recovery ability two days ago, right? This is what it is for Giannis. So the timeline here is interesting. Uh, the Bucks, sh- so the Bucks played the Celtics on April 9th, right? About a week ago, exactly now. Uh, and Giannis fell to the floor in that game, non-contact injury. And then the Bucks said the next day that an MRI confirmed that he had a left soleus, aka a, one of the calf muscles strain that would leave him out for the rest of the season. And calf strains have different severity levels that make it hard to know exactly what that's going to mean for Giannis and his availability and how effective he'll be when he plays, especially because all the leg muscles are related or not all, but many leg muscles are related in some way. But in general, if it's like the best case scenario for the bucks, like those injuries are typically a little like more than 10 days, closer to two weeks. And so if it happened on the ninth, that would be April 23rd. You know, maybe he can heal faster than that, as he does before. Some guys can. And the first game of the series, even with it being as late as possible, right? The first round games are going to be Saturday, Sunday, this coming weekend. Even if it's Sunday, that's the 21st. So it's not that surprising to me. Obviously, Giannis could make it un- like even more surprising and actually play. Again, we've seen him do this before, and this is a huge series, and the Bucks need him to be as good as possible. But this isn't like stunning to me that this is the update. He did just say, again, in Shams' tweet that it's very much in the air for game one. We know nothing after that. And I actually, unfortunately, think a key storyline to monitor this series is when are the games? What is the spacing of the series, right? It's possible that it's Monday to or Monday. It's possible that it's Sunday, Tuesday to start the series. Sunday, Wednesday gives the Bucks an extra day. For example, Sunday, Tuesday, Friday would give that two-day gap coming to Indiana, but maybe Giannis is less likely to go Tuesday, right? Like, there's all sorts of ways that this could go. And I've gotten a lot of questions about this, so I guess 
to address it specifically. The reason the game times and dates are unknown is the TV slots can't fill until the first round matchups are all known after the play-in tournament. For example, Pelicans Nuggets, yes, that has the defending champs in it, but that's not going to do as well on TV as Lakers Nuggets, or if the Kings make it through the plan as opposed to the Kings or Warriors, or even in the East, you know, the, there's a different quality of TV draw between the Miami Heat and either of the 9-10 teams. So TV networks and the timing of the games every day can't be known until that's done, and then that affects arena availability. So that's why, yes, the very first day of the series is known. It's Sunday. But the timing of the games isn't yet and likely won't be until maybe after the first round of playing games when it's known what teams could make it through, but maybe not even until like Thursday of this week. So we don't know when game two is of this series. But, of course, a huge update that Giannis could miss any time in this series. I am endlessly fascinated by what the inclusion of Pascal Siakam does to that matchup, like I mentioned two days ago or yesterday on this show, I recorded two days ago, so I keep saying that. Like Pascal Siakam's inclusion with the Pacers, no one can guard Giannis one on one, but he is the the right. They haven't had a guy that right size like Siakam like ever hardly in this matchup for a long time, and so yeah, they're still going to have to either build walls or overload the strong side or just make him naturally want to pass, which is what Giannis likes to do anyway. Uh, but Siakam being the, the main guy there with other guys helping does make a lot of sense to me. Neesmith also makes sense. He's got some strength there uh, because he terrorized the Pacers this season, right? It's very interesting. Like, it's very easy to look back and go, oh, the Pacers went 4-1. and one. They did great in this matchup, and they did. But Giannis, in, in, they played four games, right? The first one, he, he didn't really feel like that level of Giannis. 26-11, and 11, which is an amazing game. But the Bucks lost his minutes by 12, and they lost the game by 12. That was uh, January 3rd. These will not be chronological. On January 1st, Giannis had 30, 18, and 11. The Bucks lost by nine, but he specifically was plus three, right? Not his fault. He played great. The 11 minutes he didn't play went horrible. In the Bucks' one win, when he had 64 and 14, he was a plus 29. Pacers had no answers for him, right? In the in-season tournament semifinal game in Vegas, he played 40 and a half minutes. And had 37 and 10, yet the Bucs lost his nine minutes by four. They actually lost his minutes by five in a nine-point loss. And then the very first game of the season, the in-season tournament group stage game, he took 25 shots, had 54 points and 12 rebounds, and was plus six, but they lost by two. So three of the five games, the Bucs won his minutes. And in one of them, they won his minutes by 29. So in total for the season, the three wins, or excuse me, the three positives for him, he was plus 38. And the two minuses, he's minus 17. So plus 21 on the season for Giannis against the, the Pacers. And that, obviously, with two massive games, this is a little misleading. But against the Pacers, 42.2 points, 13 rebounds, 5.4 assists per game. It's a different Pacers team now. There's a new coach for the Bucs. There's new players on both teams. I get why it's not possible to take everything from those first five games. And just it, it's very tempting to do that and plug it in to this series, but I, I'm i not breaking any news or saying something not obvious. Giannis is amazing. He's amazing against everybody, and he was particularly amazing against the Pacers this season and has proved it in the playoffs before, including epic finals clinching games. Like, if he plays, he's going to be amazing. He's going to make the Bucks sing. He's going to make other guys have open shots. He's a game-changing force defensively as a roamer. I don't know who he will guard specifically. I actually kind of doubt it's going to be Siakam, but that's a conversation for a later day. But he's just a massive magnitude of force. Him not playing once is significant, right? And, and if the Pacers can win a game on the road without him, that's huge. They would then have home court advantage the rest of the series. Him missing more than that is obviously even more massive because then it's less time of him playing, less adjustments after he returns, and less time for him to ramp up to get up to 100%. So, of course, we'll see where this trends and continues to go. Uh, once we can hear from the Bucks and their coaching staff and players, we'll learn even more, of course. But I think this, if you're the Pacers, uh, is a fortunate break if Giannis is not able to go right away. I, I don't know how severe it is. I don't know how long a calf strain should be for Giannis. I don't know what this is going to look like. But given what we know now, I'm not stunned by this report from Shams. Also, it could change. things could change. He could heal. He could feel better. 
and I'll be very curious where this goes. And you know we'll be tracking here on Locked On Pacers as well, the lovely people over at Locked On Bucks. Let's wrap up some other playoff stuff and dig back into the Pacers season that was in the regular season. Some Halliburton All-NBA talk, some play-in talk, some draft pick talk, some bonuses, plenty more to get to on today's Locked On Pacers podcast. But first... This next segment is brought to us by our sponsor, BetterHelp. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest, big or small. Certain things can really start to get to you. It's important to let that out, especially to someone who's unbiased on your life. So today, I want to say how I really feel about something. You might even be thinking the same thing. I hated how the WNBA draft had to rush through the third round. They ran out of TV time. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but I they, they all just were dumped. Here's the last six picks. I didn't see them. I didn't know them. I was watching it. And didn't even know who was picked 27 through the end of the draft. I thought that was a crummy way to do it. They went right into their next scheduled program, pro, programming at 930. And I wish they could have had at least someone read the names of those players. Therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports teams or the third round of the WNBA draft. But it's important to get things off your chest every once in a while. And if you've been thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. Designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. So visit BetterHelp.com slash LockdownNBA to get 10% off your first month. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockdownNBA. Back here on Locked On Pacers. Thanks for making us your first listen today and every single day. Check out Locked On Bucks for your second listen for more on all that stuff that I just described about Giannis. They'll have the local perspective on that injury, what it could mean, and I'm sure they'll say what I should have said more. We'll see, right? The game's a far-off game, but that is the big news ahead of the series so far. I want to dive into some other stuff that I think is important. They either didn't get talked about enough or will matter going forward or is just stuff that puts a bow on the Pacers season. And I think where I want to start here is uh, a big topic that is going to be maybe the topic, uh, Sands playoffs for the Pacers in the next couple weeks. And that's All-NBA, the All-NBA teams. And specifically, Tyrese Halberton's inclusion on them. When he reached 65 games, he became eligible. I tweeted that he's eligible. I said it on the show, and people replied to me and said, well, Okay, he's eligible, but he's not going to make it. He's not playing well. And I said, I think he's a lock to make it. 90% plus, I believe, is what I said on the show and tweeted. And then I kept hearing more and more stuff from other people like, oh, he's probably third team, maybe not going to make it. And I, I, maybe I should have said like 85, 80%. I still think he's a borderline lock. And here's the thing. There's a couple things that I think matter here. One is that I think when people really get into the nuance of what his struggles actually were, and arrive on the fact that it was just shooting the most volatile thing from a skill perspective for a player, that will make people land on him making it, It assuming people do (laughs) the requisite level of research here, because he still ended the season with the per-game assist crown, and quite frankly, it didn't even end up close. Like, Trey Young could have gotten close if he played more. Uh, He he didn't. (laughs) And so that alone, like, if you're just a per-game stat sorter or someone who knows anything about Halliburton who finished – a whole assist over Luka Doncic and 2.4 assists over fourth in the league and nearly three assists over fifth in the league, just a dominant passing performance. Like that separates you in a big way. And he also, of course, added over 20 points a game. Um, I think that he will still be a very close lock to make it. You Google all NBA teams. The first two hits that come up right now are a Forbes article from Shane Young and a Yahoo Sports article from Dan Devine and both have him in. And a lot of podcasts I've listened to with national media people who actually do the work and watch games and are the reasons I listen to these podcasts, both had him in. uh, The two I listened to the most recently did. So that is generally uh, three, actually, podcasts all had him in. That is generally like my barometer right now of saying, yeah, I still think he's going to make it. But to really sort this out for everyone, right, there's three All-NBA teams. It's no longer positionless. And by the way, as an aside, All defense is no longer positionless, and that stinks for Miles Turner, not because it matters for this year at all, but because he finished top 10 in defensive player of the year voting twice, but never made all defense because Rudy Gobert and Joel Embiid were always the two centers ahead of him who made the all defense teams. He would have made two all defense teams by now uh, because his defensive peak was certainly high enough to be in there. Uh, That will no longer be the case for him. So here's where all NBA stands right now to me. 
There's eight guys who I think are locks to be on the top eight on everybody should be on everybody's ballot. I'm assuming the top four will be unanimous first teamers. And that's Giannis Antetokounmpo, Luka Doncic, Nikola Jokic, and Shea Gilders Alexander. That's going to be top four for MVP two. And then the next four guys, I think some of these guys are one of these guys have like a case for the last first team all NBA spot. And that's Jason Tatum, Kawhi Leonard, Jalen Brunson, and Anthony Davis. I think it should be Jalen Brunson. What I think doesn't matter. But those eight guys like lead the discussion that I've, you know, heard and dug into myself. And those seem like there's no way they're not on one of the first two all NBA teams when this is done. If you go to read the two articles I already mentioned about the two teams, those guys are all on first or second team. Makes sense. Then there's a second tier of guys that I think will for sure be on one of the all NBA teams, but maybe second, maybe third, but probably no chance at first for these guys. And there's only three guys in this group. That's Kevin Durant, Anthony Edwards, and LeBron James. They all seem exceedingly likely to be on that group. And so if you've noticed so far, I've said 11 names already. So there's only four spots left for Halliburton to sneak into. And that's why I think second team might be out of the question for him. Maybe you could quibble with his spot versus LeBron. Uh, but Ant's hard to catch. Ant played a lot more uh, among the group that I just said. And KD was very good. Some people even had KD closer to that first group than I did. So that is 11 guys. And I, I would say the next group, there's six guys competing for those last four spots from what appears statistically from what the discussion has been online, et cetera. And that would be Halliburton being one of them. Devin Booker being another. And Booker has been, I think, on every team that I've heard or read so far. Steph Curry, Paul George, DeMontis Sabonis, and Jalen Brown. Th uh, two of those guys, at least, I believe, th uh, three potentially, will be left off of an All-NBA team. And that does not include Wembenyama or Rudy Gobert or Bam Adebayo or any of the other Zion amazing players this season. But that's what I think it's going to come down to is can Halliburton exceed that group among voters? And he has some stuff in his favor. The assist numbers I just read, terrific stats, um, you know, the brilliant start to the season, the in-season tournament run, leaving a good first impression matters a lot in these conversations. But like Steph Curry and Devin Booker are, are like <laughs> a status players. They're going to get default votes. PG's close to that too. So it's going to be tighter than I thought after running it through like that. But I still think he's going to make it. Uh, because of the buzz that he's gotten and all the stuff I've listened to. Dan Devine nailed it in one paragraph. Dan Devine said, Halberton just became the third player to average 20 points and 10 assists per game on 60% true shooting in multiple seasons. People think he had like this down stretch, and that's still how he finished the season. The only two others to do it more than once are James Harden and Magic Johnson, former MVP winners. Halberton leads, this is now back to reading his paragraph, he leads the NBA in assists and points created by assist per game serving as the principal driver of an Indiana outfit that ranks second in the NBA in points scored per possession. He announced his arrival so authoritatively and memorably in the early going that, to me, he still belongs. That's it. That's it, right? That nails every point to me. The dominant passing to lead a star offense. He did it early. He did it memorably. The Pacers offense was him a lot this season. And, it, like, I didn't think he belonged to the MVP conversation ever this season, but like real people who, who do this job and like watch every team and really study this stuff are like, yeah, maybe like that level of player, even with the stretch he had to close the season belongs to me on an NBA team for sure. And this matters a great deal for the Pacers one, because it's a big deal for players to make all NBA as Oladipo did in 2017, 18 as Paul George did numerous times, but two for the Pacers, obviously for the contract reasons. Right. The season's now over. We have all the information. It's a regular season award. And Halliburton has, you know, 40 millions of dollars. Again, to refresh your memory, the, if Halliburton does not make all NBA, his contract going forward will be five years, 204.45 million. If he does make it, it'll be five years, 245.34 million, unless the salary cap projections change. That's a big deal for him. And I thought it was noteworthy that when I asked him about reaching 65 games, he talked about. We and us, referring to him and the team accomplishing that goal. I thought that was noteworthy and signaled to me something that always made sense, but it was also a goal for the team to get him to 65 games. They wanted to give him the opportunity to win this award. And the point I've always made to people about this contract thing is like the Pacers agreed to pay him this much if he made this team. Like they want him to be that good so, so he can make that money. Like they put it in the contract. So to me, 
to, to, to put a bow on this, I think it's closer than I originally gave it credit for, and I'll take the L for that. But I think you dig into it. You dig into who his competition is and who it isn't because a lot of other people didn't make the 65 game roll. His resume and the order of his resume specifically being good then bad instead of bad then good. I think that's going to matter in his favor, right? Like Luca, if, if, if I think if Luca's season was flipped to where he had this dominant end that he's having right now at the start, he might win MVP. He might have won MVP. I don't think he's going to. And I think Halburn did it in the order that is required to be on an NBA team. I might have said something stupid. If you think I missed a player, if you think I said something dumb in that conversation, let me know. I'm on Twitter at Tony R. East, or you can comment on this show down below if you're watching on YouTube. And we're not done here today on Lockdown Pacers. A couple of other notes I want to tackle uh, the play in tournament, draft picks, some bonuses to get to to close out today's show. But first, talk about monopoly go that's right we've all been there either as a player or as a fan it's halftime and the scoreboard is not looking good you are feeling low not sure you or your team can plot to win that's when you dig deep lift your head up and say to yourself time to get back in the game pull off some bank heists and take as much of my friend's money as i possibly can that's right the smash mobile game monopoly go lets you complete with your friends compete with your friends even to get the most riches and build the biggest empire it's the monopoly you love but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies there's so much you can do play on countless dynamic monopoly boards make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmark to the wrecking ball charge the players rent for your iconic properties. you can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in enter tournaments to get extra awards and climb the leaderboards so get back out there put on your game face and download monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play. And we are back here on Lockdown Pacers. Thanks for making us your first listen today and every single day. Check out for your second listen either all the shows of teams who are playing in the play-in tonight. West play-in. Let's go. It's time. Or Lockdown Nets. They're about to hire their new coach to replace Kevin Ollie slash Jacques Vaughn. Uh, very cool. For the Nets, Lockdown Kings also because an assistant coach from the Kings involved in that process, Kings in the plan, West plan tonight. I hope I have that right, or else I just said that twice, very confidently, uh, and <laughs> and maybe incorrectly. Um, I am using that as my segue to say the play-in. The play-in is a thing that's happening, and the Pacers are not in it. Why do they care about this? They don't even play a team that's in it. Their first-round series is set. Phew, I'm right. West plan is tonight. Uh, well, here's why. The Pacers' side of the bracket is three six two seven so whoever wins the the top east play-in game will be in the pacers side of the bracket and i only mention that to say the pacers do care right the team they play in the second round if they make it and they would be hosting if they played a play-in team uh they care they probably want it to be the team they are more likely to beat so it actually like it's a it's not a big chance but that's the team that will play the knicks in the first round that matters. If you're the Pacers, who would you rather play between the 76ers and the Heat? And this is a very tricky argument. I think you could go either way. I'm kind of just informing people that they should care about this game instead of just writing it off because the Pacers don't play this team in the first round. On one hand, Joel Embiid was a terror this season, a point per minute. Would have won MVP if he played 65 games. No one wants to play the Sixers except for the Knicks who just went for it. I love it. That's a tough matchup for the Pacers, and Beat always does well against them. They looked great this season at their best. Maybe the Pacers don't want to play them, and in that case, the Heat winning that game and playing the Knicks could be better. Pacers have shown they can beat the Heat. They also showed they could beat the Sixers, to be clear, but maybe they don't want to play Joel Embiid doing that. But maybe they've seen Joel Embiid's teams not make the conference finals ever, and they've seen the Heat make the conference finals several times since the Pacers last made the playoffs and would not like to play the Miami Heat. And Eric Spolstra and their geniusly inventive offensive strategies. I can hear both arguments. I really could. And maybe it doesn't matter. And maybe you'd just rather see the Pacers play the Knicks, who could beat both of those teams. The Knicks were very good this season. But my take is it should matter. But both because the Heat and Sixers are good enough to beat the Knicks and because that they'd be hosting that team. It's, a, it's not like an unrealistic possibility. That's the Pacers' second round series. So it's a small chance. It's just something to think about. So I. I'm of the opinion, I won't be a fence sitter, I think the Pacers should want the Heat to win. Uh, I think the Pacers 
Offensive firepower has a better chance of getting them to overcome the heat than the Sixers in a seven-game series. I'm not going to tell you what to root for, but you should care about the 7-8 game in the East if you're a Pacers fan and what it could mean for the Pacers' playoff path, even though they avoided Boston's side of the bracket, which is obviously extremely significant. That team is ridiculously good. Uh, okay, the Pacers' season is done. We've talked about the All-NBA. We've talked about their playoff bracket and everything. The draft! Not going to be a thing that we talk about here heavily until the Pacers are out, but their picks are now kind of sort of settled and sort of baked into what they'll root for in the plan tournament. Not really. Um, so the Pacers' first-round pick is gone, obviously. They traded it. It is going to the Toronto Raptors. People were asking me, what pick is it? What pick that is is gone from the Pacers? Well, that depends. Uh, they are once again in a coin flip situation. If you remember last year, they ended up winning that coin flip with the Wizards and then trading with the Wizards anyway. Uh, very weird, but they got two second-round picks out of winning that coin flip. This year, the Pacers' first rounder that they don't own is in a coin flip with the Lakers and the Sixers first round picks uh, and the Magic. Four teams finished 47 and 35. So the pick that goes from the Pacers to the Raptors could be anywhere from 16 to 19. But wait, that's not the whole situation because the Pelicans, who had a better record than that, they won 49 games, are in the play in tournament. But if you don't make the playoffs, you're in the lottery. So if the Pelicans do not make it out of the play in tournament, their pick would go from currently tied for 21st into the lottery, which would then mean the Pacers pick going to Toronto is somewhere from 17 to 20 instead of 16 to 19. doesn't really matter. It doesn't go to the Pacers. If you're a Pacers fan, you might be saying, why should I care? Well, maybe you don't. But that is the status of their first round pick. And if you want the Pacers to send the crappiest pick possible to the Raptors, well, it could be as low as 20 if the Pelicans stink it up this week and then the Pacers lose slash win, whatever. They don't care. Uh, uh, the coin flip thing, the random drawing for that pick. The Pacers second round pick, it's going to the Clippers. <laughs> uh, that is super easy. And that will be the inverse of wherever their first round pick is. Um, that does not, the lottery is not a thing for the second round. It's just inverse standing. So their second round pick would be, in theory, 46 through 49. But the 46th pick that Philly has is forfeited. Uh, so, so it's actually 45 through whatever. Uh, something like the 47th pick is going from the Pacers to the Clippers. What picks do the Pacers have? Well, that's actually a little more straightforward. When they traded Buddy Heald to Philly, they got a Philly second rounder from the Raptors. So the Pacers have the Raptors second round pick in this draft. The Raptors finished exactly sixth worst record. No one tied with them. If you listen to the show, you were prepared for that. I told you to root against the Raptors. If you're a Pacers fan in the last week of the season, the Raptors lost twice to the Heat to close it out, so they didn't end up tying the Memphis Grizzlies. The Raptors finished with cleanly the sixth worst record in the league. The Pacers' best pick in the upcoming draft will be 36. That is officially purely locked in. The Pacers' second worst pick, or excuse me, second best pick is going to be from the Cavs. They've had that pick for a bit. It is going to be pick 49. The Cavs finished with the 20th best record in the NBA. This season, which would be pick 50, but like I said, pick 45 is forfeited. So it's actually the 49th pick. So those two are locked in at exact numbers. The Pacers will have 36 and 49. Really, it's 50, but it's a forfeited pick. So 36, 49. The Pacers' third pick will TBD because of the trade. This is a lot to explain. I don't want to make this too nerdy for a podcast, but the Pacers in their trade with Golden State, when they got, took in Corey Joseph and got an absolute boatload of cash, uh, they're sending away their worst second rounder, and it's not known what that will be. The Pacers uh, will either be sending Golden State the Bucks or Warriors second round pick. And guess what? <laughs> the the excuse me the the Bucks or Pelicans second round pick. And guess what? Those teams finished with the same record. They both were forty nine and thirty three. So if they assuming they both made the playoffs, if the Pels are in the lottery. They obviously have the best first round pick and then they'd have the worst second round pick of this group. Phoenix also finished 49 and 33. So there's three teams currently tied with the same record. So what happens is the second round picks go in the inverse order of the first round picks. So the Pacers actually want the Bucks and Pelicans to be the worst picks of those three in the first round. So they're the best of those three in the second round. And then they'd either get 51. They can either get 50, 51 or 52. They trade the worst one to Golden State and keep the best one. So because they're trading the worst one, they can't have 52. So the Pacers will get 
either 50 or 51, and then they'll trade either 51 or 52 to Golden State. The play-in matters, because if the Pelicans don't make it, then immediately the Pelicans pick would be 14 and 52. 52 would go to Golden State. If they do, then the coin flip matters for all three teams. The odds of the Pacers' top-end pick being better is, is then the case, but their floor is also lower. So a lot of factors at play. Uh, the odds of their floor being worse, I suppose, are worse. A lot of factors at play there, but the Pacers' draft is going to be something like 36-49-50 or 36-49-51, and we'll see what they're looking forward to do there. Do they want to actually take guys? Do they want to try to trade up? What is their salary situation with Halbert? Does he make all NBA? What are they trying to address after their playoff run? Well, that's all stuff we'll find out in the coming weeks. Let's focus on the Bucks the rest of the week again. Pacers person talking Bucks tomorrow. Bucks people talking Bucks later this week. And we're going every day until game day. So plenty of guests will come on to make this interesting. And I'll, of course, be throwing in my own sprinkle of solo shows and commentary as we go. And we'll hear from Pacers players and coaches at their practice on Tuesday. So plenty more to add from those conversations. Thank you all a ton for listening today. Hope you learned something, enjoyed stuff, and enjoyed the season since I have officially wrapped up what I consider to be the big topics from the season. And looking ahead to the postseason is now the move. Back tomorrow, talking Pacers Bucks. You can find me on Twitter at Tony R. East and the show at Locked On Pacers. Till tomorrow, everybody, have a wonderful day.